God. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have an off season, <laughs> um, spontaneously scheduled um, talk with uh, Sylvia Salan, which is a very talented uh, PhD student, which I met in, who I met in uh, U of T last year during my sabbatical. And she was very kind and agreed to give a talk about developable surfaces, uh, which is what she's working on. And she has already <clears throat> two papers, right? Like in SIGGRAPH and SIGGRAPH Asia. Yep. And she's just a first year student. So you should keep an eye on what's going on with Sylvia. Okay, so go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just a small correction. I was a first year student when we met me since then. So I'm a second year student now. Yeah, oh man, time <laughs> flies. Time flies. So yeah. Yeah, she's <laughs> second year we stuff. never left our house since then, but still time so fast. This is uh, yeah. yeah, thank you for the introduction, Sam, Sylvia. Uh, the work, uh, first of all, the work I'm presenting uh, today is also a joint project that I did with at Adobe Research with Noam Eigerman and Alec Jacobson, my PhD advisor. So I will be talking about developable surfaces and um, I wrote a paper on developable surfaces that got published at SIGGRAPH this summer, as Mary said. But uh, these days, uh, my talk is on YouTube. So if you wanna watch me talk about my paper in depth, you can just watch that. So I figured I would try and do something different here so that uh, also so that Miri is on board because she has seen me talk about my paper many times. So um, I decided to go with something a little different and I think uh, with the aim of inspiring you a little bit more, which is a broader discussion of the whole pool of surfaces in the context, context of discrete differential geometry. So the reason I'll do this is uh, a little bit of personal history. When I was a third year undergrad, I started my first graphics research project and really like my first research project at all. And for a specific thing, I wanted to find out how one calculates the curvature of a polyline on a computer. That was a problem I had to solve and I didn't know how to look for information yet. So I just Googled it. And for whatever uh, search engine optimization reason, the first thing I ran into was this paper by Keenan Crane and Max Wodeski, which isn't even, uh, like a, a, a SIGGRAPH paper, it's like a review of a chapter in a book or something like that. Like it, there's no reason I should have looked into this, but I was just starting out and I was like, okay, well, I need to impress my advisor. So I'll just study this paper. And uh, like, it's a textbook that I'm gonna have an exam in. And one thing I really liked about this paper is that it had a game in it. So the game works like this. Uh, you have some mathematical concept, right? So like curvature you write down several equivalent definitions of that concept. So you play around a little bit like in a, you know, like a, an undergrad course, you try and find equivalences and write down several equivalent definitions of the same thing. Then you discretize, step two, you discretize each of those definitions independently of each other. And then the, 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 the fun part is that step three, you look at those discrete uh, definitions that you came up with and turns out they're suddenly completely different from each other. So you started with analytically equivalent things, you discretize them, and suddenly they're completely different and you, you need to figure out which one is better for each application. So that's kind of the game. And the example that they give in the paper about how to play the game is uh, the curvature of a curve, which is exactly what I was looking for when I ran into this. So let's begin with the first step of the game and let's do it for the simple case of a curve, curve's curvature. Now the analytical definition that most of us know for the curvature of a smooth curve is something like this. The second derivative of the curve times some unit normal. Now this second, this uh, gamma here would be the um, unit speed immersion of the, of the curve, right? And these two vectors that I multiply and actually have the same direction, right? So all the dot product is doing is if my n vector is consistently oriented, it gives me a sign. So I can say that this place here, since my arbitrarily oriented n is in the same, uh, is look, pointing in the same direction as the second derivative, then this has positive curvature and this has negative curvature because it's in the other direction, right? So the, the dot product all it's in is giving me a sign. Now, this definition involves the second derivative of the curve. So 
something we can do is we can phrase curvature in terms of the derivative of the first derivative of the curve. So how much does the tangent of the curve changes, right? So in fact, it is true that if we look at how much the tangent, the, the angle of the tangent changes, this is related to curvature. So we can take the angle of this tangent vector with respect to some arbitrary thing, since we're measuring differences, it doesn't matter here I'm using the vertical. And the difference between these two angles is actually the integral of the curvature along that section of the curve, right? So um, we can always undo this integral, make B approach A, take a limit, and get sort of a definition of an, uh, another definition of curvature, which we call, or the paper calls the turning angle curvature. So that's one definition of curvature. Let's come up with more, because that's like the part of the game. Now, one thing we can do is we can take a section of the curve and we can offset it in the normal direction by some epsilon. Now, something you might be noticing is that the length of the offset section is actually larger than the length of the original se section of the curve. In fact, if we measure the difference between these two lengths, it is also related to curvature. This is known as Steiner's formula, by the way. And we can also undo the integral, uh, take a limit as L approaches zero and get another definition of curvature, which is this, uh, we're gonna call it the Steiner formula curvature. Finally, perhaps the more in, uh, most intuitive definition for curvature that we can do is by fitting a circle. Uh, this, you might've seen this before, but basically we fit a circle tangentially to the curve at one point. Now, of course, a single point does not uniquely determine the circle, but if we impose the fact that it, it meets tangentially, so the first and second derivatives agree at that point, then it is uniquely determined. So we, we can define curvature as the inverse of the radius of this circle, which we call the oscillating circle. So, okay, we have three uh, analytically equivalent definitions of the curvature of this curve. Let's move on to step two and discretize each of them. Of course, when we discretize them, we'll no longer be dealing with this uh, nice smooth curve. Instead, we'll have a polyline, right, in this example. Our turning angle curvature, it's very simple to adapt to the polyline, right? We can always take a point in the polyline, look at its two neighboring edges, and see what is the difference between the angles of those. Yeah. Simple trigonometry, we see that this is exactly that angle. So basically the turning angle curvature becomes for each vertex, the angle between the two neighboring edges. So this is our first discretization of curvature. The second one we had was Steiner's formula, which relied on this offset that we did, right? Well, the, the way of, to do this offset in the discrete polyline, we can always just push the edges upwards, uh, outwards and join them with a, with a straight line, right? Then the difference between the length of the two pink segments and the length of the two green segments plus the, the straight dotted line is obviously just the length of the straight dotted line because the other two are just offsets of each other, right? Uh, by some basic trigonometry, we know that this length is actually two times the sine of this angle of this um, angles over two. These are already two different discretizations, right? So these were two analytically equivalent concepts. And as I've discretized it, I haven't done anything super weird in discretizing it. I just did like the basic, most obvious thing that I came up with when I uh, said to discretize this. They're suddenly completely different. And uh, some among you might already be seeing that. In fact, as theta goes, grows closer to zero, they're more similar, right? because the, the, the sign is, can be approximated by the angle, but as, as theta grows, then they'll be more and more different. So we already have two completely different discretizations of what were initially uh, in the smooth setting equivalent concepts. Now, the third one was the oscillating circle, which was uniquely determined because we said it's need, it needs to meet at this point and also have this tangent plane and this um, normal. The way to do this for a polyline is simple. We'll just take the green vertex and it's two closest vertices. Since those, since those always make up three vertices, then that uniquely determines a circle. So it uniquely determines a curvature as the inverse of the radius of the circle. So that makes 
our third discrete curvature. So now let's move to the best part of the game, which is we take this, and I repeat myself because I find this pretty fascinating, analytically equivalent originally definition. We discretize them and now we see how different are they, right? And uh, let's start thinking of some properties we would want our discrete curvature to have. Now, one I would like uh, the curvature to have is the gauss bonnet theorem. Now, this is the first thing you learn in like a topology or a calculus class, which is a simple closed curve has the integral of its curvature two pi, right? This is like a generalization of the angles of a polyhedron sum up to two pi, which you learn in uh, high school. So something we'd like, it would make sense to require is that as we sum up our discrete curvature on a, on a closed simple polyline, this sum is the same. But sur surprisingly, this is not true for two of our definitions. This is only true for the one that is just the angle. And you can probably see why it's true, right? Like if we sum up the angles, this is just a polyhedron, so it, it, it needs to add up to two pi. But it's not true for the other two. It's pretty fascinating. Now, another property we'd like is that this curvature me measure is somewhat stable to refinement. So if I take a curve and I upsample it, I hope that the curvature at that point doesn't change very much. So at, at the point I'm pointing at here. <clears throat> this makes a lot of sense because I might have a set of curves that are some finer, some coarser, and I wanna know which has the highest curvature. And I don't wanna have to weigh by some heuristic, right? Unfortunately, our first two definitions, which depend on the angle, don't satisfy this because as we upsample it, the angle locally goes to zero. So uh, the <clears throat> individual curvature at each point will decrease as you refine a curve. Now, this won't happen for the third one. Of course, there may be some variance in the oscillating radius as you approach the, the smooth curve because of the discretization error, but it doesn't like grow steadily higher or steadily lower. So the oscillating circle is good if you want to compare between different uh, curves. Now, the third property that we might want is a little bit obscure, but it is very key in some geometric applications that uh, Miri has something to do with, is that if we move every point in the, uh, in the normal direction by an amount proportional to its curvature, we get another shape that looks like this. Now, a theoretical property of this shape that you obtain is that the center of mass is maintained. So the center of mass of the black curve is the same as the center of mass of the green curve. However, with our discretizations of curvature, if we move them in the normal direction proportional to them, turns out this is only true for the second of our definition. In other words, the conclusion of the paper is there's no free lunch. We start from equivalent definitions of the same concept analytically, and all of them have these magnificent smooth world properties, all of them because they're the same, have these properties. But when one discretizes them individually, turns out there's no way of getting all of these. And you still have to choose a different one depending on what application you want to use it for. Now, I really like this game when I read this paper initially, maybe mainly because it's pretty simple to understand, but I still love it now. But the, the only doubt that might be in your mind is, okay, this seems like maybe these curvature discretization were developed like a hundred with a hundred years difference. And only now you're giving it this narrative of a game, but it's kind of like when you read a textbook and they uh, tell you about theorems that are separated 200 years in time. And it's like, they're putting it into a narrative, but really there wasn't that narrative when, when they discovered it. So it's, instead of playing the game, it's like someone's describing to you a game that you haven't really seen, right? So that doesn't really make you excited about playing. What will make you excited about playing is developable surfaces. Because this is a field where you can see the, this game being played out right now before your eyes every six months, every six I think one week ago was another uh, developable surfaces SIGGRAPH presentation. So every SIGGRAPH season, there's some advance in this direction. The, the reason why is that they're very, these developable surfaces are very pervasive in computer graphics and fabrication because everything that's made out of paper or wood or sheets of steel is a developable surface. So for fabrication, it is very key to really understand how these surfaces work. So let's consider developability as the geometric concept in this game now. And let's begin with writing uh, equivalent analytical definitions. The most direct definition of a developable surface is that it is isometric to the 2D plane, locally isometric to the 2D plane, 
uh, there's a lot of uh, mathematical precision that I will lose because I need to, uh, I, I prefer to give you the intuition, but technically everything that I say is gonna be locally uh, attached to it. So this isometry means that there's a function that goes from a planar patch P to our surface S. And this, the, the, the thing about this function is that it preserves distances. So this is the definition of an isometry. Uh, put more simply, this means that you can obtain S. S is developable if it can be obtained by bending a planar patch without stretching it. So that's our first definition. Now, a planar surface has curvature zero because it's a plane, it doesn't curve. In particular, it has a thing called Gaussian curvature zero. Now, by Gauss's theorem egregium, we know that Gaussian curvature is preserved under isometry. So if there's an isometry from a surface to another, then the second one also has Gaussian curvature zero. There also exists a lesser known theorem in the opposite direction, which says that if a surface has Gaussian curvature zero, then there exists an isometry with the plane. In fact, it is true for any constant curvature surface. In other words, a zero or vanishing Gaussian curvature is an equivalent statement to saying a surface is locally isometric to the 2D plane. So we got ourselves a second analytically equivalent definition of a developable surface, which is that it's Gaussian curvature is zero. Now I draw it as a circle here because in my mind, the Gaussian curvature is kind of like your uh, doing a geometric average of the curvature in every direction. So you're like standing at a point and you're looking in every direction, but in a geometric average instead of like a sum addition average. The way you may have seen this Gaussian curvature defined in the past is as the product of the two principal curvatures of a surface. Now, uh, intuitively these uh, directions are the direction in which the surface is bending the most and the direction in which it's bending the least the least in a sign sense. So the, the direction in which the surface is the most convex and the direction in which the surface is the most concave. Those are the two principal directions. And if the Gaussian curvature is zero, then the product of these two is zero. Now these two principal curvatures are usually calculated be, uh, as the eigenvalues of a matrix, which is called the second fundamental form. So if this product is zero, we have a two by two matrix called the second fundamental form. If the product of its eigenvalues is zero, then it means that the determinant is zero, right? Now, a matrix having determinant zero, it means that it's not invertible, it's singular. So the rank of this matrix is strictly smaller than two. This is strictly smaller. So there's a two by two matrix, the rank has to be one or zero. This is another equivalent definition of developability, right? Every, every, <clears throat> every single thing I've said so far, you can draw it as a double arrow. So everything is equivalent in what I've said. Now let's go back to our definition of a developable surface as the Gaussian curvature being zero or the product of the principal curvature being zero. Now when the product of two things is zero, fairly non-controversial statement is that at least one of them is zero, right? We're gonna make it K2 by my arbitrary choice. I've had a lot of, discussions with people about it, whether it should be K1 or K2. And it will surprise you how uh, many mistakes you can make in the code if you assume that someone is using the wrong or, or a different uh, convention for this. But for me, K2 is zero. Um, in other words, there's a direction in which the curvature is zero. There's a direction of not bending, which in our example, you can probably guess it's the orange one, right? If in, in, the, in the orange direction, nothing is, is bending. So that's yet another definition. There's a direction in which uh, locally it isn't curving. Okay, let's look at it in yet another way. I'm gonna remove the texture from the picture so that we can see it better. Uh, let's draw the normal vectors to this surface, which look something like this. Every point in this cylinder, in this half cylinder, has an associated normal vector, which you may know as the normal map, a map that goes from the cylinder to the space of unit vectors. Now the space of unit vectors, we can usually represent it at, on a sphere, right? Because every unit vector is a point on the sphere. So we can plot it and see what the image of this map looks like. And it turns out it looks like something like this. It looks degenerate. 
on, on the sphere. This isn't true of a surface in general. Usually the image is a non-degenerate region of the sphere. However, it is true if your surface is developable. And I wasn't really happy with this explanation. So I looked for a GIF that my advisor made, which will make it very much clearer. So, uh, so here, we're going to draw a region of a surface in yellow. And we're going to look at the normal map on the right in blue, right? So you can see here that for this whole region, the normal map is not degenerate. It, it has an area on the surface, right? So this is an example of a non developable This is another example of a non-developable surface. Now, this is what happens for a developable surface. Right? The map is degenerate. It's a line on the sphere instead of a, a, a region with area on the sphere. I think those gifts are pretty explanatory, much better than what I had. <laughs> so, okay, so, so a degenerate normal map is yet another analytically equivalent definition of developability. So, we have our five definitions, which all say the same thing in the smooth world. Let's move to step two, where we discretize these definitions. I changed the order a little bit for convenience. Some of you may guess why, but uh, I wanted to change it a little bit. Let's begin with the first one, which is that the surface is isometric to a 2D plane. One way of directly translating this definition to something discrete on my computer is by starting from a discretized planar patch like this and explicitly building the mapping that goes to a developable surface. So if I ensure that distances are maintained as I deform this planar patch, then necessarily I'm building an isometry. So necessarily the thing I get at the end must be a developable surface, right? So this is a way of directly using this seemingly abstract definition of the isometry, right? Indeed, th this very, very summarized because you can see there are four papers here. So uh, there's a lot more than I'm not saying, but this is, the strategy pursued by a series of work by Rabinovich et al. and uh, more, more recently, Ion et al. from the ETH Interactive Geometry Lab. They explicitly build this isometry, basically. So let's put these papers here next to the definition as a sign that we have uh, discretized them already and there, there exists a definition, a discretization. The next definition we saw was that the surface was developable if its Gaussian curvature was zero everywhere. But this may seem promising at first, and it usually is the first time you start working on developability because the thinking goes, oh, curvature. I'm so used to seeing curvature everywhere. This is so well studied. Why do I want to come up with a different definition if I can use all the breadth of knowledge that there is about calculating curvature and then just use that? Like, What is going to be better than something we've studied for so many decades, which is how to calculate different curvatures on a surface? right? And uh, you may know that the usual way of discretizing Gaussian curvature is the angle deficit. So we take a vertex i and we say that the Gaussian curvature at that vertex is 2 pi minus the sum of the incident angles on that vertex. Now, obviously, if we are in a flat plane, this is zero because the angles sum up to 2 pi. If we're in a developable surface, it is also zero. So that's the important part. The this measure of Gaussian curvature preserves that about developability. As promising as this may look, it isn't really a good strategy for reasons that are very well studied. Basically, uh, you can have a shape that is arbitrarily crumpled, but still has zero Gaussian curvature. So it doesn't, it's very, um, the level of detail is very dependent on the, the level of detail in your discretization. So you want to get these like very nice looking, smooth developable patches with this definition. So it isn't something that's very being very studied right now, but you can still find work that do this explicitly and see what uh, the problems are. So let's just leave them here as get another discretization in our ongoing table. Then we have that a surface is developable if there's a direction in which it doesn't curve. Now this is uh, purposefully vague because there are many papers that go in this direction uh, one that I like that is pretty representative is that to ensure that the curve, the shape doesn't curve in one direction, you design the shape as in terms of two bounding curves 
and you just join those curves with edges so that there's always a, the edge itself is the direction in which there's no curvature. So as long as you make it very low res uh, shapes whose edges exactly correspond to these directions of curvature, then you have a developable surface. This isn't entirely true because, um, and, and the, the paper I like the most about this is this paper by Rose et al in SGP. It, you don't just need to join the two boundary curves with edges. You need it to be locally convex, which is like a stronger property. This is the equivalent of saying it's a, a rule surface whose tangents are, so whose ruling directions are in the same tangent plane locally. But basically the idea is that you make a very low rest mesh where the edges themselves correspond to directions of no curvature. Okay, so let's put it a, as a representative of the many words in this direction. Next, we have our definition of developability where the normal map had a degenerate image. How do we translate this to a uh, triangle mesh? Now, a way to translate it is by looking at the one ring neighborhood of a vertex and plotting the span of the normals of the faces. If they are collinear on the sphere, then the one ring is developable. If they aren't, it's not. And there are many ways that you can check for this collinearity that may seem a little abstract, but for instance, if you take the, the, the triple vector product of any three normals, the volume has to be zero if it's collinear, but it, it, it isn't zero in general if it isn't collinear. So if you, for instance, you can use that as a proxy. That is exactly what, sorry, what the route taken by Steinwell is, which is, uh, Kind of the state of the art, sort of to to work on developable triangle meshes. So they they define a vertex as being developable if its neighboring one ring faces are collinear. Uh, the normals are. So let's add this to our list, and let's move on to the last one, which is that a surface is developable if everywhere the rank of the second fundamental form is small. Now, this is the definition that we came up with in our recent cigarette paper. So I'm going to go into a little more detail uh, of how we came up with it and exactly how it works. Beginning with why we worked on this project, the question we wanted to answer was, what is the closest piecewise developable or developable surface to a given non-developable one? So what's the closest developable thing to this bunny? And according to a method, it would look something like this. The way we phrase this is as an energy minimization. Uh, we give our method an input surface, and then we minimize an energy, which will account for that input surface. And the minimizer of that energy will be our new surface. Our energy will have two parts. One that says, OK, my output needs to be developable. And another one that says, but also it needs to be similar to the input uh, surface, right? So basically, the a mathematical translation of saying what is the closest developable thing, right? So let's begin by building the first part over the energy, the developability energy, which will be the hardest one. Uh, to do this, we just realize this definition. The surface is analytically developable if the rank of its second fundamental form is everywhere smaller than two. Now, our first observation is that if we have a surface that can be defined as a height field, so it is, a, it is a graph of a function z defined over a region of the plane. Then this second fundamental form, which for some reason I changed the notation here, it should be the double i thing that I showed before, is proportional to the matrix of second derivatives, which is commonly called the Hessian matrix of this function z, right? So we can redefine a height field as being developable not if the rank of its second fundamental form is low, but if the rank of its hashing is low. This already gives us a pretty good candidate for developability energy. Something we can do is integrate the rank of this hashing everywhere in the, in the rectangular domain. Now you can think of this integral as a double integral in X and Y that we're used to seeing in calculus. In, in reality, we can use any domain that is not rectangular. It just needs to be contained in the plane. However, 
the problem we have with this is that the rank is not a convex function. And we would like that our energy involves only convex function so that we can guarantee that it has a unique minimum. We can use convex minimization techniques. In general, when you're doing optimization, convexity is like the gold standard as the thing you want to aspire to. So we want to spend a little time trying to make this convex. So what we'll do is we'll use the convex envelope of the rank. Instead of the rank function, we'll use the nuclear norm of the Hessian, which is uh, a thing I didn't know about and, until working on this project, basically defined as the sum of the singular values of a matrix or um, the, the sum of the absolute values of the eigenvalues of a matrix. It's actually a pretty simple thing, right? Now the, the, the surprising thing is that this is a convex function, something that like you're summing absolute values of the uh, eigenvalues of a matrix. Surprisingly, that's convex, which is fascinating to me. So in fact, it is the tightest convex envelope, meaning that there, there can't be a better function to approximate the rank of a matrix while being convex. So this is gonna be the developability term in our energy. If you remember, our energy looks something like this. So we're gonna substitute our new developability energy here. Now, if you remember the data fidelity term on the right here, uh, wanted to penalize deviation from the input. It was the part of the energy that was telling us, okay, but you need to stay close to the input bunny, right? So an immediate choice is to just pick the L2 norm between our surface and the input surface, right? So this is a, a nice smooth energy that balances developability and fidelity to the input. However, we don't want to give this to a pure math grad student and spend so that they can spend three years minimizing this. We want to minimize this quickly on a computer with finite memory and finite processing power. Uh, so we need to discretize it. And the obvious discrete equivalent of a height field is a depth image where we have a finite square of pixels with an associated uh, Z value for each of them. This is like, an image basically. So it's easy to translate our energy from before, which had all those integrals into sums. So all I've done here is I've taken the integrals from before and I converted it into sums and I've added an I uh, subscript to everything so that I know what I'm summing over, right? Which corresponds to basically every pixel in the image. Now, uh, one thing we can do to make our formula simpler is we can imagine that we have one big column vector z that contains every height value and then the 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 right hand side of this equation we can make it this this l2 norm between the, the big z column vector of our of our output and the input now our only remaining challenge is to discretize h the hessian matrices right and this in some way needs to depend on z um, for a square, pic a square pic pixel grid like this, when it can approximate the Hessian at the green point number five here as a linear combination of the height values in all of its immediate neighbors. This is done, done with something called quadric fitting, which is fa a fairly simple concept. You find the closest quadric function and then you do the analytical he Hessian of that quadric function. Uh, I won't get into exactly how we do that, but basically it can be done like that and that's a linear uh, function of the height values. But this method introduced a high degree of bias in that has like an X and Y preferred directions, then it turns out, we didn't expect this, but it turns out that uh, our, our Hessians are more likely to be aligned with those X and Y directions than with any other directions. And we want a method that avoids directional bias because Partly because as we'll see later, directional bias is the downfall of many other existing developability methods. So this is something we felt very strongly about. So we felt so strongly that we changed our whole discretization to a hexagonal grid. So instead of having these, uh, this pixel grid, we're gonna have a hexagonal grid. And similarly, we can do quadrant fitting again, and we can get the curve, sorry, the Hessian at point four, as a linear combination of the neighbors. And surprisingly, this is bias free, right? Now, this A matrix is the same for every, for every point because the neighborhood of each point is the same. But what we can do is we can combine this A with uh, 
simple selection matrix that that identifies every point to its local neighborhood, right? So we can write it like this. So it's some matrix A, which is like that thing does the same for every every point because the neighborhood is the same, times the selection matrix that identifies what the neighbors are, times our height value. Which means that we can rewrite our discrete energy like this. That's the last step. We have a, a nice looking discrete energy, which is convex, depends on one variable, which is Z, and we can minimize it. And the, the way we minimize it is uh, by making use of all that previous effort where I told you, no, we really need this to be convex because it's gonna be really good if it's convex. This is the point where we cash in that, that hard work because it turns out that both these circles are convex functions. So one circle combines, the, the green circle here combines the, um, a linear function of Z, which is convex because every linear function is convex. The nuclear norm, which surprisingly, like I told you, it's convex with a sum over, over every vertex, which is also convex. And the right circle, the blue circle, also is like a multiplication by a constant and a quadratic function, which are also convex. So basically, this uh, sum in two, the two convex circles, we get a convex function. So this energy as a whole is a convex function, which means that we can use convex optimization. In fact, it's a semi-definite program, which is even better than convex. But and, and we explained how we know this in, the, in an annex in the paper, but in fact, we're not gonna make use of it. What we're gonna make use is a more intuitive uh, observation, which is that this green circle is local in a way where this is purely intuitive. Uh, we, we go into more depth mathematically about why we say this in the paper, but the intuitive meaning is that we're measuring local information and then adding it up. For every point, we're looking at its neighborhood and deciding how developable is that neighborhood. While this other part is global, it's looking at two shapes and telling me how similar are they. So this local global duality uh, might be ringing a bell in some of you. It makes it a perfect candidate for ADMM minimization. This is called the alternating direction method of multipliers. It's becoming increasingly popular in geometry processing research, or at least, uh, I think my advisor is making everyone use it. So I see it more, uh, but basically it's a, an iterative minimization, convex minimization method, uh, which combines a local update where like an update associated with the green circle, which in our case has a closed form and we can parallelize, so it's pretty fast. And a global update associated with the blue circle, which in our case is a linear, a uh, system of linear equations, which we can pre-compute often. We can pre-compute it forever, but we can make use of pre-computation. This is very interesting. I really encourage you to look at the paper. Um, but this is all I'm gonna cover about optimization because it can get uh, pretty deep in notation. So this is a pretty good description of our method. Now let's see it in action. And let's begin with some experimental evaluation. The most basic question we want to answer is, does our method really output a piecewise developable output, right? That was the goal all along. Do we manage to do that? And one thing we can do to evaluate that is to look at the Gaussian curvature. Now, Gaussian curvature was one possible definition of developability, but it's not the one we're using. So this is a good proxy for whether we do output a developable thing, because we're checking with a, cur with a different definition, not with the one we're actually optimizing for. So here we're printing the, the absolute value of the Gaussian curvature in blue, basically blue meaning bad, blue means not developable. And our output has the developability, concentrated increases, which is what we want from a piecewise developable surface. Okay, so this is working. We're happy with how it's working. Let's see what we can use it for. The immediate application and the reason Adobe patented this is that denoising depth scanning data. So we scan the pages of a book, like in this example, um, we do it using a, a smartphone app on, on my phone, but we see that the output has an acceptable amount of noise. And we could smooth this with a Laplacian smoother or any other type of smoothing method that have been studied for centuries. But 
those methods don't make use of the fact that we know it's made out of paper. We know the output surface has to be developable. Our method would do just that. It would smooth the developable pages of the book, but note how it doesn't smooth the crease in the middle between the pages, because that part is developable, right? You can always fold a piece of paper in the middle. This is what it would have done. It would have been to smooth the, the crease in the middle, right? Now our method can take any input. It doesn't need to be like very, very close to developable or a developable thing with noise. So for instance, this height field of the San Francisco Bay Area, I picked this because I was living in San Francisco for this project, uh, contains high and low frequency detail and is very far from developable, but our method makes it in, into, into one. So it works. Finally, another nice application then uh, Adobe likes is to developable modeling. So given a set of constraints that you can draw in Photoshop, we can minimize just the developability type of our, sorry, the developability term of our energy to get a piecewise developable height field. So this is like a very quick, uh, easy way of designing developable surfaces. Uh, for example, we can take the real world plan of a cathedral that I found online and build it a developable roof just by setting some constraints in Photoshop, which is pretty nice. Um, okay, so that's our 2020 center of paper, which every time I talk about it feels further in the past, but uh, let's add it to the list. Meaning that we have all the decentralizations of our analytically equivalent concepts. We, we made it this far, everyone. Uh, so we're done with step two now. We move to step three, which is a fun one, where we compare all of these discretizations. And for simplicity, we'll restrict ourselves to these three. The uh, Rabinovich et al. ETH papers um, of explicitly constructing that isometry, the Stein et al. paper where we looked at the normals of the one ring neighborhood and saw if the normal map was degenerate, and ours that I just described to you based on the rank of the second fundamental form. And let's do the same thing we did for the curve, curvature of a curve before. We said, what are properties we would like this curvature to keep, right? One simple is generality. I like to apply this definition to the most general set of shapes possible, right? I'd like to uh, go into some uh, online page, download a triangle mesh or download a quad mesh and just say, is this developable? And have an answer that says yes, and that's it, right? That, that would be the, the best case generality. A failure case of gen generality is this isometry approach. At least in its current form, there's this recent 2020 paper that does something that slightly more general, but I, I think it's still fair to say that it can only be applied to a very specific set of net representations that they describe in the paper. They lead to all these like, incredibly beautiful developable surfaces, but they're very restricted. Then they can't just give it any mesh that we get online and apply that definition. The Stein et al. Uh, approach by construction works on any, tri any manifold triangle mesh. So it, it does really well on this front. You can download a mesh and just run this method. And in fact, you can do it because uh, their code is completely online, easy to compile, at least for me. And you can just try this. It's just pretty fast and the code is very well documented. So I, if, you, if you're gonna start with developability, I recommend that you really do look at, at their implementation because it's a really fun way of trying things. Um, so, you, so this is definitely the winner in terms of generality. Our method on the other hand works only on height fields. So that is a big restriction. Not every surface can be described as a height field. I raised sort of here because technically you could still calculate the second fundamental form of a surface and see if it's developable, but it wouldn't lead itself to all the cool convergence guarantees that our method has. So let's say that the Stein et al approach here is clearly superior in generality. Now, another thing we want is user control. Ideally, we want our definition to easily lend itself to an artist or a designer being able to balance the developability against other aspects like closeness to an input, or I want it to be smoother over here or anything else, right? An example of this is our work. And in our work, we have this Lambda parameter that weighs developability versus data fidelity. 
And as we change it, we get um, we get an output that's more uh, faithful to the input or less faithful to the input, but more developable. So basically, you can choose between how many patches am I going to have or how close am I going to be to the initial surface. So our method is pretty successful at this. Uh, the Stein et al. work doesn't really, because it doesn't keep track of what the input was. Perhaps someone can conceive of ways of modifying their energy to add something like this. I don't want to make a mm, conclusive statement that it's impossible, but they don't explore this. So I'm, I'm going to give them a, a failing grade in this uh, user control aspects. On the other hand, the ETH papers do allow an uncontained parameters like this. Unfortunately, they don't really explore it. But I'm still going to give it to them because the parameter is there. I could just change it in their code and that's it. OK, so that's it for user control. Another feature we'd want our definition to have is this queryization independence. Now, this is very important. It's a fairly, uh, there's, these are pretty big words, but the simple way I like to frame it is what I call the cylinder test. So all through this presentation, I've used a cylinder or a half cylinder to, to illustrate a developable surface. And there's a reason for it. It's probably the simplest developable surface one can think of that isn't flat, right? So it's, a, it's the simplest developable surfaces, surface that can exist. So for your method to be, to have any sort of discrete in, discretization independence, then no matter how I discretize a cylinder, it should be read as a developable surface. And your method should say, oh, this is developable. This is already developable. I'm not going to touch this, right? And to see, this might seem like every method should do. Let's look at the, let's look at the Stein et al. work, right? Now, if we have a cylinder and we mesh it with a mesh whose edges are aligned with the direction in which the surface is not bending, then their method does identify it as developable and it doesn't change it, right? It says, oh, you gave me already a developable input. Now I'll give you back the same thing. However, if we rotate the discretization by 90 degrees, this is still a good match, right? This isn't something that we would look at and say, oh, this is horrible. Nothing that I compute on this match will work for anything. These are good triangles. Every vertex has valence six. This is a good match. Still, it doesn't register the cylinder as developable because the, the, the edges aren't aligned with the bending directions. It will return something that looks like this, which is pretty, but it's not the cylinder. It should return the cylinder, which was already a developable surface, right? So that's a fail. Ours and the ETH method pass in this example. The ETH method will perfectly be able to build a cylinder by bending a planar patch into a cylinder like I did with the sheet of paper in that uh, GIF. And so will ours. It will take any cylinder, it will keep it like that because it's already developed. These are three examples of features that I've gone into a little bit in depth, but there are many others. So for example, we'd like the definition to lead to a rich space of developable surfaces, which may have creases and bendings and weird transitions between patches. This is something that our methods and the Stein et al. do pretty well, but is the major restriction of the isometry approach. Since you're building the isometry, basically you can traverse between disconnected regions of the space of developable surfaces. That's how I like to think about it. And you can only stay within one, one space. You can't bend or anything like that. They do have subsequent papers where they discuss bends, but they have to be prescribed. It, it's, they, you can't change from a bent part of the space to an unbent one, which is something that ours and this time papers do. We may ask for resolution independence, initialization independence. This is one of the best features of our method. It's, it's convex. It doesn't matter where you initialize it, the minimum uh, will always be the same and will always reach that minimum. That's a guarantee of IDMM. Or whether they easily output a developable segmentation of the input. In other words, again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So different definitions that were, again, analytically equivalent, the same thing. We discretize them and, they're, and they lead to vastly different properties. And what's, what's even more exciting, two of the papers in this screen were published in 2020. So this is a very, very interesting ongoing work that you can see in real time every CGRF season. Uh, my pitch with this talk is that perhaps by next year, 
we have a new row to add because some of you got inspired by this stuff and said, okay, I'm going to solve it. And it's going to have all these properties. And I think my, my claim is that when this happens, uh, I, I hope it's someone from the Technium, but even if it isn't, it will be because someone came up with a yet another analytically equivalent definition that happened that when discretized happened to have all these properties. So it'll be by playing this game again. So to sum up the thesis of this talk is that developability is the perfect case study in discrete differential geometry, which is ongoing, is very fun, and it is something you can contribute. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, just a second.